Hey, everybody, and welcome to our Facebook Live. It is May the 2nd, I believe. Can you guys believe that it's May? Summer is just around the corner. I am excited. I know all the deers here are excited. In the uh, house here, I have Jennifer Deer. Hey, Jen, you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. So Jennifer is here. She'll be uh, fielding any questions you guys have during this live. And I also have Jesse Deer here. Hey, Jess. Hey, and James over in the corner. Hey, everybody. And I have uh, Daisy and Ragnar here, too. Those are the pups. So if there's some heavy breathing, it's it's not me or any of the others. It's the puppies. So anyways, uh, glad you guys could join us. We are looking forward to a really fun uh, Facebook Live and a, a little bit nostalgic. But before we get started, I do want to share something with you guys because this has been on everybody's mind for a while. We've had questions asking when is there going to be a hatch digitizer sale and they just announced yesterday i think it was like 6 a.m mm -hmm. that digitizer is on sale for 200 dollars off and yeah we are excited i know we've had lots of people excited about this one it's been a while since they've actually had a sale and remember if you do support the deers embroidery legacy you get the exact same sale price you get all of the hatch academy lessons you also get um, $251 worth of exclusive bonuses. That's access to our Digitizer's uh, uh, dream course. We give you the first level to it. We give you ESA fonts. We give you our uh, eight hours of theory-based education, all to get you started on your software journey. So we are super excited about that. Just so you know, on the slide there, and we have uh, Chasing Storms, and we have... Uh, the little guy there, that is Beth. She can't be here tonight. And my uh, grandson, Eli. So anyways, uh, that is Mother's Day coming up and they have a great sale on. Fantastic Anything else you want to add about that, guys? Day. We're good? Okay, awesome. Well, we are actually here to talk about patches and we're going to do patches made easy. And we do have some really cool new patch designs that I want to show you. Uh, as well as some modifications that we have made uh, over the last while. And I just want to give you guys a little bit of background as to why we're kind of uh, known for patches uh, throughout the industry and have been for many, many decades because my grandparents started our family business back in 1958. We're 65 years in. That's my grandfather standing there at that Shifley loom. He's on a manual pantograph. And over on the side, you can see another picture with my Aunt Helen, my grandfather, and my grandmother. And that is the first year they started their business. And that's the first machine that they actually started the business on. And if you notice on that machine, there is running patches. And we didn't do one patch at a time. Those looms ran on what was called quarters, depending on the spacing of the needles. And you would run anywhere from 108, uh, 28 to 1,084 patches all at the same time, depending on the size. Um, also, just a little forenote, uh, I actually learned how to digitize or punch, as they called it in those early days before computers took over the process, because punching or digitizing has been around for about 150-ish years now. But I learned at the age of 17, in my first two years, learning how to punch was on that same machine that you see my grandfather standing at, and I remember that uh, panograph in my hand sitting on a wooden crate and literally going like this one stitch at a time. So that's how embroidery was done. We didn't embroider directly on garments. We embroidered patches for the most part or yard goods. And that's why our original business is called Dress Crest Embroidery. We did, you know, uh, yard goods for apparel and the bridal industry. Uh, we also did patches and crests, mainly in the early days for government contracts and for corporate designs. And then we moved into, I guess, modern embroidery in the 80s when uh, the multi-needle machines started to take uh, you know, root. But even before those machines happened, my first digitizing system, which was a Melco Digitrack, we actually had a single needle um, Ultramatic machine, which was an embroidery machine, but it only had one needle that went up and down. It looked like a sewing machine more than anything else. And the really cool part of that was we controlled the speed with a little handle on the side. So the belt would get tighter and the machine would go faster. You'd loosen it up and it would slow down. So this is a rich, rich historic industry 
that has been around for hundreds of years. And that's what some people don't realize. Today we have machines that are computerized and software and all that fun stuff, but it all stems from the same thing, a single stitch. And the way we created stitches 150 years ago is the exact same way that your machine creates stitches now. So that's what we wanna sort of get across to you. Uh, this here is a couple of other pictures. That lovely lady standing on that same Shifley loom, that is my mother, Bridget. And she was a little younger than she is now, but she worked on the Shifley machines as well. My grandmother was there on the mending machine and my grandfather was on the clicker and the clicker actually was a hydraulic clicker. We had dies made so that we would take all of those patches and if it was a big enough order, we'd have circular dies or dies of different shapes and sizes. We'd have those made and then you would literally punch out all of the emblems on that clicker and uh, the other cool thing was before you could actually embroider directly on garments, we worked with jacket manufacturers and they used to sew patches on jackets. If you were around in the 70s, uh, you will probably remember when you got a jacket with a corporate emblem on it or a crest on it, they were sewn directly onto the actual jacket. And the jacket manufacturer used to send us the panels of the jacket before they were assembled. And my grandfather, uh, not my grandfather, but the clicker that we had in our factory, we would actually take a little round die and we would punch a hole through the left chest of the jacket, right where the patch was going, so that if anybody tried to take that patch off of that jacket, they would have a hole there. So that was one way that the jacket manufacturers and the corporate companies that you know, supplied all of these things as gifts or incentives, that's how they ensured that they wouldn't uh, give it to somebody and they would take off the patch and have a jacket. So the marketing cool. would continue. Yeah, the marketing will continue. We did marketing way back then and we do marketing now. It's just changed and evolved over the years. Uh, as I mentioned, my, my family started in the 50s but this is a picture in the 70s, and that's my Aunt Sabina. She must have been about 13 years old at that, that time. Unfortunately, she died when she was 17 years old of cancer. But I remember uh, we were in the tourist uh, industry for emblems, and I do have one of our original uh, emblem brochures. This is the brochure here from the 1970s, and we did emblems that were actually, uh, this is a card from my grandfather back in the 50s. I, I found that actually a little while ago. But this one here is emblems that we would actually do for the novelty and tourist industry. And we had hundreds and hundreds of stock emblems. And we used to do gift shows and travel all around the, the country at that time and sell patches. Patches was a big deal. And if you remember patches back in the 70s, give us some thumbs up and some hearts, but it really was the root and the foundation of our business. And if it weren't for patches, we would not be here today. Um, if you look in the back, right behind my grandfather, grandfather and under that sign that says Dress Crest Embroidery Company Limited, you'll see a little uh, black piece of cardboard there probably. But on that was our original Disney crest. We actually did 36 different Disney characters and I believe it was 1972 that we did these for Walt Disney. And uh, they are kind of cool because I still have a complete original set of all 36 of those designs. And, uh, and we have a whole bunch of others. But these are kind of really awesome because they do go all the way back to 1972. And if you look at a marrow border, the border that is created around a patch from 1972, and you look at that same border on a machine that was done you know, this year in 2023, they'll almost look identical to each other. Maybe a little different because the thread that we used back in those days was not as synthetic uh, as today. So they might have a little bit of a different feel, but the actual stitch that they created is pretty much the same. And that was, I guess, my goal was to create a simulated marrow faux border because the marrow machine, it's a specific machine that creates those. And this is what the machine looks like right here. These machines have been around forever and a day. Uh, they've been in the industry for a long, long time. And if you want to do a marrowed patch, a true marrowed patch around a piece of uh, fabric, an emblem, you need to have one of these machines. And that little picture there of Dopey, that you can see, that is an actual patch from the 1970s. It's one of the ones that my grandfather did for Walt Disney back in the day. 
and there we have mini mouse as well but what i wanted to do was i recreated our marrow borders and i created a, a new motif called a rem5 motif and if you look at the similarity between my machine embroidery marrow which is rem stands for realistic embroidery marrow and the five stands for how many passes of thread it is actually very, very similar to the actual marrows that were done back in the 70s. So that's kind of cool. And I'm not going to bore you with a lot of the theory that goes into that because I had to redo everything that we had from scratch. But it does have no penetrations that go over each other. So if you do have multi-head machines, my designs will run really well because that's our roots. We did millions of patches throughout the years. And we know that it's all about production. But the way these are engineered is they are engineered so that they're actually what I like to call curvilinear, which means that they uh, embroider perfectly on straight lines, but they also handle curves a lot better than any other motif that we've ever done. And it actually is really important when you get into really strange shapes of patches, because even in the old days, those marrow machines couldn't handle tight corners because you'd have to turn the patch as you went into those corners. So I wanted to get that simulated marrow stitch, but turn really sharp corners, which couldn't even be done with a marrow machine. And that's what we sort of uh, tried to achieve. And I think we've done it. Now, just so you know, we've had patches available for a while, but we have, I think, 19 different patch shapes available on our site. And I know the kids are gonna put up some links to all of those patch shapes if you wanna see. All of those traditional patch shapes do come in four different sizes. So when you get that one circle or rectangle or shield or egg shape, whichever one it is, rounded corners, straight corners, you'll get it in four different sizes. It'll show you the sizes that are available and it's all with our new REM5 stitch. So you'll get that authentic vintage marrow look to this and they'll sew out great. We also have one other that's called our large circles, which is really big borders for large circles. And I did increase the size of those motifs so that it would actually be reflective of the larger size of the emblem because you don't want to have a thin little border on an eight inch you know round circle so i tried to take that into account as well so we have lots of different borders to choose from and just a little while ago we released what i was calling my braided borders or braided patches and this is really kind of a a, a braided almost rope effect where you have the same I guess, steps for creating the patches, but it looks like a completely different motif or border going around the edge. So that's uh, kind of cool. Uh, one thing I will show you, because I did, I did want to show this one, and I don't even know if Jesse has seen this, uh, but Jesse, what's your favorite sports team on the face of the earth? If you had to choose one. I hope you're gonna. I hope you're gonna say the one I want. Well, I see what's in your hands. So I'll okay. Say, I'll say Toronto Blue Jays. Okay. Well, and I, I said that because what's your favorite bird on, in the entire world? A blue jay. So we actually did the blue jay uh, patches back in what? What year was? Did they win? Ninety two, in ninety three, I think. Wasn't that when they won the World Series, Jen? I know you'd remember. 92, yeah. Yeah, I think it was 91, 92. 92, 92 because I think. we were in Toronto with our factories at that time. And the Blue Jays won two consecutive years in a row. And do you remember running all that? Those uh, I sure do. You know, it was this like insanity for three, 24 hours a day for six months. All we were running was Blue Jay stuff. So Jesse, do you want this patch? Sure. Just kidding. Okay, no, no. Here, <laughs> I have a few of them. So, anyways, because I know he'll hang that up by his desk. That is a vintage 1992 World Series Blue Jay patch. He's got a smile on his face. You should. It's I, fine. I didn't want one either. Okay, James. <laughs> James, the good news is I have another one with your name on it. Do you like Blue Jays too? I love Blue Jays. Okay, there we go. The Leafs did win actually recently. We saw that. Anyways, uh, we'll get away from sports, but the uh, the patches. That's pretty cool. Now we do have something completely new, and this one I came out with because these are all kind of standard shapes. And I wanted to do something different with our new and improved REM5 border. And we did actually what I'm calling a premium patch kit. Uh, it is a military biker kit that actually has uh, 12 different designs in two different variants. So they have the line going through them or not going through them. Keep in mind that they come in one size. They aren't in four different sizes. But the, the real reason why these are kind of impressive is because of how they turn the corners on these designs. 
They look like a authentic marrow stitch, but they turn the corners really, really cleanly and sharply. And I'll actually bring a couple of these up onto the big camera just so you can see them. And let me just hide this one real quick right here. Switch the camera over right here, okay? And if I look at this, you can see when I get into the corners right there, that corner as it goes into here, that would be almost impossible to do with a marrow machine or this little peak on the bottom, but they actually sew out perfectly. And we have a whole bunch of different variations of these patches and they're all traditional for military and for biker. So they are great. And the idea with these patches is because they are a do it yourself patch, you add in whatever lettering or whatever uh, objects you want inside of these, and then you finish off the patch. Now, I will let you know that all of these patches, if you see them, they're kind of curling up on each other a little bit. And that's because these are kind of half baked. They're not 100% done. I'm going to show you how to get that real authentic, authentic patch look because I do have a video that shows you the entire process of actually completing those. So those are the new patches that are available with our, within our premium patch kit. And I have one more surprise because the, I guess the sale price on that is we actually have it available for $24.95. Jesse, you said that we're going to have this up for like a week, right? Okay, so it's going to be one week that we have it on sale. After that, these patches will go up on our regular patch, I guess, part of the site, and they'll be available in individuals. So you'll, you'll get them individually. And I think it works out to like 190 bucks or something if you were to buy them individually. So it's a great deal, but we made it even better by adding these premium patch kit glyph designs. I actually digitized all of these glyphs. There's 20 different designs. I do supply the EMB file format for these, so they are resizable. And a lot of these, if you look at some of the fine detail on things like the, uh, the guns that are within this, you'll see that the detail is incredible. I'm going to go back to the camera for one second, go right over here. Here's the actual sew out. And if you look at my finger, okay, you can see my thumb there. And then you look at the detail of all of this. A lot of this detail that I put into these tiny little pieces of embroidery, they actually, because you can actually see the trigger in there, uh, these were done, a lot of them, one stitch at a time. I manually inputted them so that you would get really great results at a size that is friendly for an actual patch. So you do get the uh, patch shapes, plus you get all of these glyphs included so that you can make your own patch. So I'm gonna show you real quick how you can make a patch within Hatch. And did you have a question, Jennifer Deere? There was a question, yes. Sure. Uh, Vicki is asking, does the patch edge cut itself or do you have to trim it after it finished stitching? And how do you attach to the items? I'm gonna show you guys a video afterwards because a picture is worth a thousand words where I'll show you the entire process of how we do it. So All you right. get that perfect clean finished edge. So that'll be a little bit uh, later on. So Vicki, just hold on and we'll make sure we show you that and it will explain everything. So I'm gonna to go to my hatch software right now. I'm gonna make my face a little bit smaller and I'm gonna quickly put on my goggles because I can't see anything. And we will do a design setup for you quickly so that you can see how this is done. Okay. So here I have my software. I'm going to insert a design. So let's just insert a design here. I'm going to go to wherever I put my patches, which I should get better at this now. Oh, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna go up one and let's just choose, let's see this one here. And let's choose a PES file. So I know I get the right colors. Okay, so here we're gonna bring in this one here. I'm choosing this one. Now, keep in mind, these are not EMB files, so these are not EMB grade. I have to save them in expanded file format so that it doesn't mess up the motifs because the motifs are what makes this design work so well. And keep in mind, I didn't just digitize one motif. I actually have five different motifs that I use to handle all of these types of corners so that you don't get crazy buildup of stitches in certain areas like right here. If you tried to use a standard motif, and that's why sometimes I've seen software, some software programs do automatically create marrow type faux stitches, but they never handle the corners or those things as well because they aren't engineered to you know, go directly into a sharp edge. You, you'll get sort of 
fraying on certain areas or it will look unfinished. And that's what makes these ones a little bit different. So I have this base design set up. There is actually within all of the pieces, I'm just going to uh, take this and let's uh, go in and actually I'm going to leave them as is. I actually have right here a uh, outline stitch, a tack down, and then the finishing stitch. So if I want to add some lettering to this, I can just come here. Let's just type in my name. So I'll do John Deere with the lettering and there my name comes in. And if I want to try to stylize this, I'm just going to cheat real quick and make this easy. I'm going to use one of the embroidery art pieces, hit that H key and oops, I didn't want to do that either. So let's take this, click off of it now. And I'm going to hit that H key so that it actually allows me to take it into more of a peak. And then let's take this and make the width, let's say 85%. And I might even have to go 80% to try to fit it in. Uh, you know, this is, oops, that's 88. Let's go one, let's put a zero in there instead. But this is just kind of cheating. And now I can take that piece here and let's bring it right inside. And if I planned it properly, it should almost fit perfectly within that motif. Let's make that a little bit smaller. So we'll do that at 3. Uh, 0.35 inches. Normally I like to use work in metric and that looks good right there. So there is the one little piece that is in and that one is now set up and I have that. So it's kind of following the look of that marrow. Now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to start inserting a couple of other designs and we're going to use some of those little uh, glyphs that we include with it. So let's just tab up. I'll go to my glyphs. And because I am so cool, and you guys, if you've been around for a while, you know that I love skulls. I'm gonna put a skull in here, and let's just come in here, and there is my skull. And I'm surprised my kids, my boys, did not just uh, laugh out loud when I said I'm so cool. No? Okay, <laughs> they're, both, they're both smiling. Okay, and I'm gonna change the color of that one. So there's that piece. And then if I wanted to, I could even grab another piece here. So let's insert a design. And I'm going to take this one and I'm going to add in a sword. So let's take a PES sword. Actually, you know what? I could use an EMB. If I would have used EMB swords, I could have resized them, but I, I'm happy with that skull size. But let's do this so that I can open this one here. It's going to come in. I can click on that. I can turn it so it's going to go at a little bit of an angle. So I can bring it in like that. Oops, grab the wrong one. Let's go over here. Let's grab the right one. And let's bring that over on this side right there. And then I can take that and I can duplicate it. And after I've duplicated it, I can mirror it. And I can take that one and move it over to the other side. And I know that's a little bit uh, corny, but I'm going to grab those, turn that yellow. And in reality, I've just created a patch that is ready to sew. And that's exactly what we did when we... Uh, you know, created these. I have one here that's going to sew out on the machine that I'm going to show you right now. And I think I do. Let's go right here. I'm going to see if I can open it. And if I saved it in my file folder, yes, I did. I actually ran two samples. So you'll see why I did this afterwards. But I actually ran two samples because I did one with regular embroidery and then I did one with puff stuff so that you can see the difference. But that's the file we're going to run on, on our machine. And Vicky, this is going to show you how the process of doing this actually happens. Any questions, guys? Awesome. Okay. Either people know exactly what we're talking about or they're just uh, interested in listening. If anybody has learning. questions, feel yeah, free to send them on. If anybody has questions, please let us know. Okay. So here I'm going to show you guys uh, the video and let's see if I can get this. Okay. So I'm going to show you some products afterwards. Now, keep in mind, you do not have to use the products that I'm going to show you or put links up for on our website. I know that you will get fantastic results if you do, but I will give you some other options. If you don't have a uh, patchback twill, and a patchback twill is a poly twill, but it has some special things, I guess, added to the recipe, you can use anything within your fabric stash but you will probably want to back it properly so it has a little bit more structure because patches generally don't flop around. They have some structure to them and it's that buckroom backing that actually does that. So I'll start the video here and I'll kind of talk through it. So we have a piece of tearaway stabilizer. I have my uh, patch uh, poly twill and that's a twill that is specifically for patches. I'm just going to hoop my tearaway stabilizer 
and I'm going to take a little bit of painter's tape and I'm going to take my twill and I'm just going to tape it in on either side. Now, the reason why I'm doing this step first is because I want to pre-cut my patches. And you might have seen there that I had a little cuticle stick, a wooden stick. You're going to see why I like using those afterwards. But the first file that we include for you is a run stitch file that just outlines the shape of the patch. Because if you want a perfect patch, you should really pre-cut it like you would an applique to make sure that it's going to be perfect all the way around the outside. Now, my suggestion is when I cut out my patches, I cut, I cut right on the dotted line. I cut the running stitch. I don't cut outside of the running stitch. I don't cut on the inside. I cut literally right on the running stitch that you see. And that way you know that it's going to be the exact perfect size for the actual uh, patch itself. We do include the SVG files if you do have a cutter. Now that is our prep uh, patch uh, product and it is like a plastic, 100 micron plastic that is kind of bubbly on one side, which means that it's not like regular plastic that's smooth on both sides and will actually slip. It actually holds in place because of the bubble texture. I did show you really quick a piece of wash away stabilizer because you don't have to use our product. You can use a wash away stabilizer as well. Regardless, I do suggest you use our T-pin structure, put some T-pins in there so there's no slipping within the hoop. And then the first stitch it's going to do when you load the design is actually a outline stitch. And then you're going to stop the machine and you'll remove the hoop from the machine as soon as it does that. I suggest at that point, you can either uh, pre-press your patches. I have some, uh, you know, Tetral Magic or spray. I might want to, you know, sort of heat it and make sure that I flatten those patches. I want to get rid of any little threads that are on the back side of that so I have the cleanest possible result. And then I'm going to press my patches so that they actually flatten out. And if you need to use a little bit of, you know, starch spray or something, you can. I used a little bit of uh, spray adhesive on there. I put it in place and it just holds it temporarily. This is where my stick comes in because it's being held in. I don't want to get my fingers too close, but that little wooden stick helps me get really, really close to the edge so that I can go around two times. That's going to secure the patch in place. And then after it's in place, it will start to do the zigzag and all of the inside stuff. It'll do the border around the outside. Because you have software, and hopefully you know any software will work, but if you have Hatch, you can resequence all of your objects, so you don't have to do the border first. But I do kind of suggest it because at that point you know it's going to line up, and then it comes in and does all of the embroidery. And here I used actually four different little glyphs, so I wanted to make sure I showed you as much of the glyphs as possible with a little EL on either side for embroidery legacy. Same thing for this one, but then I put on the puff stuff. And the puff stuff is our water soluble 3D puff that you actually put down as part of the process. You don't have to digitize the design any differently like you would for 3D foam because this product literally melts away with room temperature water and a little bit of uh, you know scrubbing with a toothbrush after it's done. But I'm doing all of the embroidery right on top of the puff stuff. So when I have this finished, I'm just going to remove my object from my hoop. I'm going to just cut it down the middle and I'm going to take away the uh, plastic around the outside. It tears away perfectly. You'll have no residue around there. Our borders are nice and clean. So there's really nothing to finish after that fact. And then for this one, I'm going to do the same thing. Just pull off the plastic but I'm going to then cut away as much of the excess puff stuff as I can so that uh, you know, it just makes it easier when I put it underneath of the uh, tap to get rid of it. And then I'm going to take that item, bring it over to my sink and just literally wash away that puff stuff. And it's such a cool product because that marrow border, when you actually add the puff stuff, looks even more like an authentic marrow border because it actually raises and you actually have a raised effect for all of the objects that are within that design. And there is a little side by side here. This is the post patch. And I will admit that I messed this up. I should have put the Teflon underneath. I had to clean up my surface a little bit. But all I do after I stick that uh, on is I cut around very quickly around the outside edge and then I can peel it away 
and I have a nice clean finish back. None of these patches are kind of bowing like the other one was. I showed you those ones that I said were kind of half baked. They weren't finished. When you put on this post patch material, it is an iron on adhesive. So you can on a baseball hat, stick this onto a hat and use a heat press and it will adhere to it. I wouldn't necessarily do this on a wearable item because it will stick, but you'd still probably want to sew it on but it gives you a real 3D authentic look to the design when you're done. So that is the how-to when it comes to actually making a patch from beginning to end. We give you the file for the outline. If you have a scan and cut or a Cricut or any of the other cutters, we give you the SVG so that you can cut it on your machine. Uh, we also give you the files so that you can run it on your machine as a finished patch. Questions? Yes. Can Hatch Software make patches like a woven patch? She, This person uh, has problems creating small letters or picture designs. Uh, Hatch can do a lot, and yes, it can do small lettering. There's a video coming out next week on YouTube, James. little okay. teaser. Okay, so is it next week? No, I'll check it next week. Okay, no, is it next week, James? Okay, sorry, I, I really want this one to come out because I did some testing with small fonts and I actually did a two millimeter font. So it really depends on the lettering that you're using and the thread weight and a bunch of other factors. But yes, you can pretty much do anything in Hatch, but in fairness, you can do stuff in other software as well. It's all about having the knowledge and know how, how to do it. Okay. Uh, Anna's asking, what was the fill in that patch? The fill? Yes. Uh, the first, uh, actually there was no fill. No, if I look at this, here is the, actually, well, here it is right here. Here are the two patches. Okay. This, uh, this one, this one is the uh, puff stuff right here. You can kind of see how it's raised a little bit. Let me switch this camera over. This would be better. I think she was asking what the fill stitch density for puff stuff. Oh, the fill stitch density. Sorry. The fill stitch density for puff stuff is you don't need to change it. Just standard density if you put the puff stuff down. And this is the puff stuff right here. I don't know if you can kind of see that raised effect, but it actually does give you a really nice 3D raised effect. And here is without, it looks kind of equally as good. But the real difference is when I showed you this one before, you can see how this one is kind of like bowing and it looks, you know, a little, a, a real patch, if you buy one in the store, should look like this when it's done. It should be stiff and flat and it's all about the process of finishing it off on the back so that you have everything your bob your uh, little tails from your your you know underside and your bobbin are covered and you have a nice finished product done and here's the other one that we use same thing exactly the same motifs and uh, it looks great when it's done awesome okay christine uh, is saying remember to save the scraps for your puff stuff what to use with the small projects Oh yeah, for sure. The puff stuff, you can do all kinds of things with the little leftover scraps. And uh, I can't say when, but I do have some really cool designs coming out that are going to use puff stuff. So Jennifer says, so the puff stuff doesn't come out under the thread with the water. Uh, magically, it doesn't. It stays underneath of the actual stitches. And once I do suggest that when you, you get rid of the puff stuff, I use a uh, soft toothbrush and I actually have to work at it because if you don't get the residue off, it can kind of have a little bit of a difference of color between the twill and the one where the twill and the stitches connect to each other. I did actually buy something. Jen, can you run, do you see right down there? And that's not a gift for you. You see on the ground there, it's charging. A little round thing? Yeah, a little uh -huh. round thing. You can give me that. Jennifer, this is one of my Amazon purchases. Jennifer, oh. do I do I have a do I have I a problem? This bat. <laughs> do I have a problem with Amazon? There's always a spender and always a saver. Uh, Jennifer, let's just say I'm not the spender. Yeah, Jennifer's a saver, but I bought this for doing puff stuff because it is actually apparently it's meant for like exfoliating your face or something. I have no idea, but and it has different speeds on it. But I'm going to actually give this a try when I do my puff stuff because I think that this little Amazon toy is going to do great for that. And it was well worth the $19.99 I spent, Jennifer, because every... Okay, sorry. Uh, I have to justify my purchases like most of the... Was it you. 20 bucks or 100 bucks? No, no, it was not $100. Uh -huh. It was under 30 Okay, okay I know for yes. sure it was oh, under no, $30 no. <laughs> guaranteed. 
maybe twenty four ninety five. Okay. So anyway. Susan is asking, what heat press were you using? Uh, the heat press that I was using was one that actually Stalls uh, carries, and we are not affiliated with Stalls, but they obviously have been in that side of the industry for forever. Uh, I've purchased heat presses on Amazon, strangely enough, again, Amazon thing. And uh, I have uh, seen a big difference in quality between a quality heat press like that one that was in the picture from Stalls and one that I have purchased from Amazon. So that would be like an iron. You guys know that if you guys are in the industry, there's a big difference between irons or steamers. Uh, same thing when it comes scissors, to heat pressing. Scissors, yeah. for sure. That is a big difference. So you better spend a little bit more. Carolyn has an interesting fact. She says, no question, but she has the original of your Mickey Mouse patch. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. I have one Mickey Mouse patch actually in my collection. So I only have one Mickey. And if you have a Mickey, then that means I know of two that are still in existence. That's awesome. If you could send us a picture or me a picture of that, I would love to see it. Uh, that was a big, that was a big milestone for my grandfather. I remember that was one of his really proud moments in the industry was when he got the contract with Disney World. And the last uh, trip I made back to Canada when my grandmother passed away, uh, I actually found one of my grandfather's original business cards. They made them a little differently in those days, but his business card is here and it says Romeo B. Thaler, but his last name originally was Churchenthaler and he has it written there and it's like 18 letters long. So kind of, kind of fun. Uh, any other questions or should I move on? You can be fun. Okay, awesome. So that is the patch kit. And as I mentioned, you get all 24 of those patches within that patch kit. And you also get the glyphs as a bonus. So everything comes with it. If you want to do military or biker patches, you have everything in one kit. Awesome. Okay. Now the patchback twill. I will let you know, we now have 20 different colors of actual uh, patchback poly twill. Now the twill is polyester, which means it's, it's awesome for cutting. It's not going to shrink. Back in the days when my family actually did patches in you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, we mainly used cotton. And Jennifer, you might remember this, but you remember on the Shifley machines, we would actually take that... Uh, long piece of cotton material and we put it on the spanning table mm -hmm. and then we had big pieces and the the people used to hold it with two hands but they had big pieces of wax do you remember mm -hmm. that yeah and what we would do is we'd span the material on a big table and we'd take wax and we'd have all of the people in the factory start to wax the back of that material and it really helped the needles to pass through the actual fabric uh, and it helped give a little more structure as well and then we use buckram and that's where this does come into play because the uh, patchback twill that we have, and I'll just get this off for one second. Here you can see that it is a polyester twill. So it's a nice twill that will hold fine lettering. A lot of times, you know, we talked about fine detail and lettering. If you're using a secure twill like this with a tight weave that actually has not just a PVC backing, but this buckroom that's laminated onto it as well, this is what gives those patches the real structure. And that's why we brought this product in. We do have it available in 20 different colors. And I know that some of the colors we are sold out of right now. So if you go onto the site, there might be a couple colors that are sold out, but there is more coming. So just keep your eye open for that. And I know that we do have a special where you buy three colors or three yards and you get the fourth one free, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is available. I think the links are going up. But that is where our twill for patches is specifically different than a regular twill. It's not just the twill with the PVC. That buckroom is what makes it unique. Uh, and keep in mind, again, you can see how it curls up. You will need to heat it before you apply it. Or sometimes I have used, you know, the Tetral Magic or some starch, uh, you know, spray. And I'll actually spray it and then press it. And that way it's nice and flat. So that is something. Uh, also, the kids will be putting up a link to our other products because we do have a tacky patch fusible stabilizer. I, I really suggest this product if you are using some of your own stash. So if you're using some of your own fabric and you want to use it for fabrics and it doesn't have the buckram or PVC, you'll want to put the tacky patch stabilizer on first. 
it actually helps because it you don't have to spray it with any adhesive because it will stick onto the uh, prep patch film. And the prep patch film is there. That stuff is awesome. We use it for all of our patches and I've started using it for a lot of our other projects as well because it doesn't actually tear away. I've seen some people on you know different Facebook groups that say they're making patches and they actually take a water soluble stabilizer. You know, it looks like plastic, but it's a very, very thin water soluble stabilizer. And even though they're trying to take like three or four layers of that, when it starts sewing anything with a standard density, it will break away and you're not gonna have good results. So either use the prep patch or you can use a water soluble stabilizer. That will work, but keep in mind that you will have to wet the edges a little bit to get rid of that white residue of the stabilizer after you're done. The post patch, that stuff that actually makes your patches nice and stiff and you know, I can basically look at it this way and it's like a straight line. That is great for finishing it. We also have been playing with in about four weeks, I'm gonna do another live where I'm gonna do some more patches, but I'm gonna use Mylar. Keeps the density down, keeps the sparkle up. It's a form of multimedia. So we do have magic sparkle sheets, which have that Mylar effect. And then of course our puff stuff, which is awesome for patches because it just raises the effect of whatever stitches you put on. Keep in mind that a fill stitch will hammer or smash down the puff stuff a little bit more and the satin stitches have more loft, just like any, I guess it's a natural law of embroidery. Fill smash, uh, satin stitches have more of a concave effect and reflect light more. So those are all of our different products and there should be links to those. Uh, I will also mention that we just added this and if you could listen to what I'm gonna say, I would really appreciate it because we added what we call our perfect applique poly twill. And we've had a few customers who have accidentally ordered the applique twill and had it delivered and then said, how come there's no backing on it? It's because we have two different products now. We have one that is actually the patchback twill that has this backing on it, buckroom backing, and our applique twill which is a poly twill does not have that. It just has the PVC. You can see it's kind of shiny there in the light. This stuff is perfect for doing appliques or if you want to, you know, if you want to do, uh, I guess in the, the industry, remember we used to do tackle twill letters and stuff and, mm -hmm. and we used to do appliques on jerseys and all that kind of stuff. This is the type of material that you use for that because the PVC gets rid of any fraying on the actual twill. You have nice, clean, smooth edges, whether you do a satin stitch, a blanket stitch, or a zigzag stitch, you'll always get nice, clean results. And those also are available in the same 20 colors, uh, and it's the same special. So if you do go to our pages, and they are separated, we don't have them side by side, but please make sure you're ordering the correct product that you want. The one for patches is a little bit more expensive, and the one without the buckroom is a little bit less. Right. So Lisa said, what was it that goes on the back of the patch? What was the name for that one? The back of the patch is actually the post patch. So the prep patch is the plastic that we use for making the patch itself. And the post patch is the ironed on or heat pressed, uh, you know, piece that goes on afterwards. You just press it on. It's 360 degrees for 15 seconds. You take it off, let it cool, cut around the edge of it nice and close, and then the paper peels off and you have that nice finished look on the back of it. So it comes out perfectly every single time. So anyways, who wants to win? Did we have more questions? A few more questions. Okay, let's, do, let's do the questions and then we'll do a who wants to win. Well, why don't you get people typing out whatever it okay. is and then we'll ask. Uh, what should they type out, Jess? You choose. Patches? Sure. Okay, type in, type in the word patches because we're going to give away a free patch bundle to, I guess, YouTube and to a Facebook viewer. Okay. Okay. And hit me with your questions, Jennifer. Okay. Mary Ann says, is it possible to decrease or increase the size of the pre-sized patch patterns in case this different size needs to be provided? Uh, is it possible to increase or decrease? The answer is no. The reason why is the patches in the exact sizes that I've given you, I don't include the EMB file, which is the native file for the patches. 
because they are created with custom motifs. And when you take motifs and you actually resize them, they don't resize properly the way a regular satin stitch would. All of the perimeters of the motif change along with it. And then we'll have gaps or no gaps and all that bad stuff that could happen. So I do not include the EMB files because the motifs will alter. I will also mention one thing within Hatch specifically. If you, uh, in Hatch, when you open a file, you can leave it to stitches or you can convert it to outlines, which in the software, and again, uh, if you don't know where that is and you own Hatch, please join our group and post the question. But when you're bringing in my patch files that are a PES file or DST file, make sure you tell the software to keep it as stitches. Because if you convert it to outlines, then what happens is it will register a trim command after every single motif. We've seen that happen in our groups before where somebody said, I bought the patch files and it was crazy because there was a thousand trims. They couldn't get through a single patch. It's because the software is trying to re uh, mathematically adjust every single motif, motif independently. So please keep the sizes as they are and we'll try to come up with as many pa different patches as possible so you get perfect results. Okay, Susan is asking if you could share your picks for the heat press. Uh, picks for the heat press. Uh, da -da -da -da. Actually, I might be able to bring that back in. Uh, tell you what, Jennifer Deer, I'll bring that in at the very end, okay? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Joy, we can ship to Australia, but you would have to email in to us and ask, um, I guess, just give us your shipping address and what you're interested in, and we can give you a quote for the shipping. Awesome. Uh, Vicki is asking, if you use a different design on patches and you don't know how to digitize yourself yet, does the digitizer have to digitize it any special way to make it work with the patch? No, nope. uh, patches are, are almost like embroidering on a denim jacket because they are such a, a secure material and just standard density, standard underlay. You don't have to worry a lot about pull compensation. You don't have to have crazy high or low densities. Uh, something on a patch should work pretty well as long as it's digitized well. You don't need to make any special uh, you know, accommodations for it. Okay. Janet's asking, could puff stuff be used with freestanding lace? Uh, yes, it could. We actually have been experimenting with that. So yeah, give it a, give it a shot. We are going to, you're going to see some really cool stuff come out from us as well, but yeah, for sure. Freestanding lace and puff stuff is a very unique combining. Keep in mind that when you actually do wash away the puff stuff, it turns a little hard and starchy to you know, keep that loft. So if you're wanting to do a, a nice, beautiful bridal gown and you wanna do lace on it, brides are supposed to be soft and pliable, I think, aren't they? If you do a puff stuff bridal grab, she'll be like a walking robot, I think. You definitely, she'll be not flexible <laughs> at all. I don't think that's stiff, but yeah, okay. It's, you know, it'll be <laughs> stiff, so yeah. If you want a stiff bride, no, just kidding, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, Tony or Christine is asking, how well does the tacky patch fusible stand up with heat? Some fusible stabilizers shrink when the heat is applied. Uh, for patch, the patch purpose I, that we've tested, it actually does its job well. Even within the sample or the video that you saw, I didn't use it within that uh, you know, thing because I didn't need to. My, my twill is not going to shrink, but I, I'm not gonna say it's perfect by any means because you will have some circumstances where you might use some of your own fabric. And if it is a fabric like a cotton that will shrink after laundering, then you're going to attach something that may have a lot of shrinkage and something that doesn't that you've adhered to it. And you're gonna cause puckering in that because one's shrinking, one's not. So yeah, really test it first and try to you know pre-wash some fabrics I mean, and that was something that we had to do in the old days quite a bit. Remember, we used to pre-wash a lot of our things mm -hmm. because, they, you know, because things weren't synthetic in those days. There was a lot of shrinkage in items. Yes. Yep. Um, can we dye white twill to get a color that we didn't that we don't carry? Would they be able to dye the white? Would they be twill? able to dye the white twill? Uh, you'd have to test it because it's a polyester, a synthetic fabric. I'm not sure if it would actually hold the dye or not. So you'd have to test it. Uh, 
We used to do chenille crests and uh, patches. And if you, if you know chenille machines, I, I have one lying around here, but it's that kind of looped appearance. And a chenille machine or a Cornelli machine uh, was done on uh, a, what they called scrimp. It was like a really thick felt. And we used to actually dunk our felt or our scrimp in tea. Remember, Jen? Mm -hmm. We'd actually have tea solution and we'd dunk it in and bring it out real quick and let it dry. And then it looked vintage, uh, like it was actually an old thing that was 40 years old. So I'm all for playing with stuff like that, but you have to test those things with the products to see if they work. Does the pre-made patches have the post-patch backing on them? The pre-made patches, which I did not show you, we have our, or sorry, pre, uh, ready-made, we call them ready-made patches. The ready-made patches do automatically have both the PVC and the buckroom already on it. And we'll be doing a, another live in the near future showing you that process as well. We figured too much all at once would probably not be a good thing, but uh, we still do after we finish the patch process. If I want it to have that nice finished backing where we see it looking nice and shiny, after I do the ready-made patches, I will still back it with the post patch to finish it off. But it does have the PVC buckroom recipe. It's a blank patch. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, and I think I have one, I have one right here beside me at my desk. This is a ready-made patch, which we do sell on our site as well. And the ready-made patch, the difference is, and again, I'm not gonna go onto this uh, a lot, but it is actually a marrow bordered patch. This was done not on an embroidery machine, but it was actually done and then done on a marrow machine. I can tell because that little tail right there is the tail that's left over from a marrow machine. When I was four years old, I used to get paid for gluing down those tails with white glue. I got paid a penny a patch and I worked about 25 cents worth of patches. That was my work day because then I could go to Frank's Variety Store and get candy. So go ahead. Probably took you all day. <laughs> it did, pretty much did. But I, yeah. Gina says you may be able to dye the white with sublimation ink. Okay, so, sublimation ink. Mm -hmm. Yep, and multimedia. I mean, that's the beauty of the age we live in. There's so many toys and technologies that you can play with and share them with us. Like that's the, We're all learning. I'm learning new things as well. Uh, could prep patch film be used in any other way, hooping something else besides for patches? sure. I, I've used it for doing bookmarks in the hoop projects. It is a it's a great product. Uh, earrings. Uh, we have a new fun thing that we're coming out with soon. I can't say what it is, but we are using that product as part of the steps as well. So yeah, there's lots of uses for the prep patch besides patches. Kate is asking, can you put the mylar overpuff stuff? Can you put the mylar overpuff stuff? I haven't tried that. I put it, I put it under, but I haven't put it over. So thank you for that idea. I will, I will say if we do it and it's successful that one of our people on our lives suggested to try this, but please try it yourself as well. But I'm going to give that and a shot. Let us know. Yeah. yeah and let us know, but I am going to give that a shot and um, see how it works. Bonnie, your question for what's best for heat setting. Christine is suggesting uh, the iron at 350 to 370. Yeah. Yeah, 360 for, for the, if we're talking about the post patch, the directions on our site say 360, I think, for 15 seconds on average. So okay. and that usually gives it more than enough. Okay, so are we ready to win, guys? More questions? Uh, I think that's it for now. Okay, so if you would like to win the patch kit, we're going to draw, you have a couple more seconds to type in patches, but uh, who's doing Facebook? Okay, James, who's the winner on Facebook? And the winner is Vicki Turner. Congratulations, Vicki. Woohoo! Congratulations, Vicki. If you can email into contact at embroiderylegacy.com and Leanne will set you up. Yep, and we have marked down your name, but for mm -hmm. sure. And for YouTube? The YouTube winner. I got past the name of Brian Stockton. So congratulations, Brian. Congratulations, Brian. Also, same thing, please just email us at contact at embroiderylegacy.com. And I kind of made a little bit of a mistake here. Uh, stitch to win. Uh, oh, I think I might actually have it up. No, I don't. Okay. Uh, uh, the next live, I'm going to have to do the stitch to win because I didn't, I didn't load the software or the names. So anyways, let's just pretend you didn't see that.
but we, we are going to have a stitch to win. Bethany's going to be upset <laughs> yeah, at Bethany's you. Yeah, Bethany's going to be upset, but she's <laughs> not here today. Uh, sorry about that, guys. I, I didn't get it loaded up at the last second. Uh, but we will do the stitch to win on the next live, and we'll continue to catch up as we go forward. If you don't know what the stitch to win is, anybody who, who posts one of their projects that they did with one of our designs on our Facebook group, all you have to do is put a ha hashtag there of, uh, what is it? Legacy? Embroidery, Embroidery Legacy. Legacy. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of every month, and within two to three months after the month ends, we will draw you as a winner. So, And the link that they've used of our design? Yes, and the link that you have used for our design. And we will post the winner and their project within the social media group. I might actually uh, do a surprise live uh, at some point, maybe James and I will do it just to post that winner. So we might do a surprise little live just for the, and we'll do that on Facebook maybe. Okay. Okay. And guys, don't forget, we do have the Hatch Digitizer on sale right now for $200 off, which is a great deal. And you do get all of our bonuses. I do want to wish everybody a happy Mother's Day. Our last live, we did a Mother's Day uh, I guess, feature of all the designs that we did for Mother's Day. I won't show you guys all the new designs, but if you want to check them out, you can follow the link that the kids are going to put on, I guess, uh, pretty much right away, because we do have at this point 115 Mother's Day and Father's Day designs available on our site, and they're all on sale for 50% off. So instead of $3.95, you're getting them for under, uh, I guess, uh, $2 each. So... Anyways, those are available. And also, let's not forget uh, Mum, our last Facebook Live. We did this uh, design, which was our ESA, uh, what was that font called? We just released a video as well, didn't we, James? Like a couple hours ago. Yeah. The sequence, the ESA sequence font that we just released. And there's a video that went up today where I went into a lot more detail uh, on creating different effects with that one ESA font. But on last uh, the last live that we did, I did this layout, and it is a free download. So hopefully the kids are going to put up where that link is. And we just want to thank you, moms, and tell you that we love you. And we did do it for all of our moms in uh, Australia and the UK as well. I did post one with the M-U-M -M spelling as well. Right. So we covered our bases there. Awesome. And, and you mentioned that you were going to sh sh show or say something about the heat press. Yes, I will end. bring up that slide in one second. Okay. And uh, before I do, the uh, Embroidery 101 cheat sheet. If any of you have an embroidery machine or are thinking of getting an embroidery machine or have anything to do with embroidery, this is a must because it's free. And it will, I guess, equip you with a lot of the standard I guess, theory and education that I think every embroiderer should know, which are stitch types, underlay, pull compensation, and how designs are mapped, and all that good stuff. So I'm going to uh, call up that one design. And Jennifer, if you want to just fill in some blanks or if there's any other questions, let me find that picture. I'll bring it up so that everybody can see it. Any last minute questions? This is time to get them in. And sorry, guys, just give me one second. With the, um, how long would you say that you would put the heat onto the product for? You said about 360 was the temperature? 360 for 15 seconds. About 15 seconds yeah. or so. Okay. And I'm hoping I can find this, guys. Just give me one sec. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I found it. You got it? Yeah, I did. I found it. I just have to bring it back up and share it. This one actually is a picture of two different heat presses that are available at Stulls. Uh, again, uh, they are, uh, in my opinion, a really quality machine. This is one of those things where you will buy one and it will last you probably decades but you will pay for that uh, privilege of uh, having a piece of equipment that, uh, that lasts. This pink one, which was the one that I'm using that you saw in the video, that one is a little bit of a smaller field and it is basically meant for more the crafting industry. 
Uh, we do also at our other studio have the other one that you see there, which is definitely more commercial. And if you are doing, you know, uh, sublimation transfers, you know, any of direct to, not direct to garment, but anything that requires a heat press, that is more the commercial standard and you will pay for, you know, that type of equipment. So awesome. I think that is it. I'm pretty much done. Mama dear. Yeah, no other questions I've seen. No other come questions. Up. We're going to send well, you something. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Give us uh, some thumbs up, some hearts. We really appreciate you guys. We we uh, realize as a family business that we can only do what we do because of, of you guys supporting us, and we really do appreciate it. And we do love what we do. So that's and you know how much how much more blessed could we be that we get to actually work together. Uh, as a family and for the most part get along right guys <laughs> <laughs> okay anyways we're good we're good yes okay, happy awesome. mother's day everyone thank you happy mother's day and we'll see you on the next live take care bye